Hello, this is Ariel of Inconspicuous Bear, and I'll be narrating the 10-man version of the Paragons of the Claxi Encounter in the Siege of Ogrimmar from a Guardian point of view. When you're first starting out on the Paragons Encounter, it can seem overwhelming due to the sheer number of abilities and wall of text that you need to read. Um, however, since there's only actually three bosses up at any given time, it's a lot easier than it sounds, um, and there's very actually very few things you have to worry about as a tank, um, but I'll make sure to cover all each of them in detail so you know what to do uh, for each given boss, whether or not you're actually tanking it. The first boss that comes down is named Rickle the Dissector, and he has two abilities that tanks need to worry about. The first is called Genetic Alteration, which simply increases the damage taken from Skier the Bloodseeker by 10% per stack. Um, this is something that Rickle applies to the tank, intended to make it so that you can't uh, have the same person tank both Skier and Rickle, essentially forcing two tanks. In reality, you could probably get away with tanking both Skier and Rickle on the same tank. Um, however, since you need two later for Zaro and Kilrick, it really doesn't matter. Um, second ability that Kil uh, Rickle has is called Injection. This deals uh, na stacking nature damage to the target um, for each application of injection. However, it can be negated by simply having a Savage Defense active. Um, since you can have a Savage Defense active for every injection, it doesn't matter. Um, as long as you're tanking properly, it'll be just fine. Um, and Rickle dies incredibly, incredibly fast. So you really, in reality, should probably only have to worry about two maybe three injections tops depending on your dps um, sometimes if your dps is really good you can get away with as little as one and you only have to have, make sure you have savage defense up for that single injection the second boss that comes down is called skier the Bloodseeker. he has a s similar ability to rickle uh, it's called hewn which increases the damage done by rickle uh, to the person with hewn by 10 percent per stack it's designed to force you to have two tanks one for rickle and one for skier um, he also has an ability which will spawn big slimes that come towards the bosses. Um, generally, tanks don't have to worry about those. However, if your DPS isn't uh, that great, um, or you're like just progressing on the, on the boss to start with, you may end up having to, say, uh, charge and stun one of the slimes in order to make sure that it dies or gets really low before it reaches the bosses. However, that depends on your strat. Normally, TPS is deal with them, and tanks don't really have to worry about them at all. The last of the first three bosses you'll fight at the start of the encounter is called Hissick the Swarmkeeper. Um, now, he can't actually be tanked. He'll just randomly shoot people. However, he has an ability called Aim, which draws a line between him and a target, usually a ranged of some kind. This will deal, after a certain amount of time, uh, 1.4 million physical damage to the target, assuming there is no one else between him and the target. What we found is that it's beneficial to have tanks stack in this line, plus some other ranged people, um, because tanks naturally have high physical damage reduction, and therefore will take basically no damage from the aim, assuming there are enough people in the line to spread the damage out. Note that again, this all depends on your strategy. Some people are perfectly fine with just having melee soak the damage, and others are would rather have tanks do it. Better sort it out with your guild before you jump in and do anything crazy. Fourth boss, Karos the Locust, becomes activated when one of the first three Manta dies. He actually needs to be tanked. Um, he doesn't have any special tank-specific ability or anything, um, but he does have two things you should be aware of. The first is Flash. Um, basically, he just points at someone and charges towards them. Um, anyone caught in his path um, start taking lots of physical damage. So if you see him pointed at someone, and you're between them and uh, Karaz and that someone, get out of the way. Um, the second thing he do he'll do is periodically fly up into the air and then throw Amber on the ground. Um, this does a lot of damage to people if they're standing in it, so if you see Amber appear on the ground, run away. Pretty simple. The fifth boss, Corvin the Prime, will be activated when the second Manta dies. He has one primary tank combo, which you need to be aware of. You and your co-tank, obviously, need to be aware of. It's called Shield Bash, which stuns the target, his main aggro target, for six seconds, followed by Vicious Assault, um, which does six attacks in succession, the first of which deals 200, 200k physical, followed in the increase after that. So it's six attacks, every half, one every half second, um, for three seconds, and if the person that Shield Bashed eats this, they can't, like, dodge or block or anything like that, right? Um, you... If you're, like, feeling macho, you can probably, like, just pop SI before Shield Bash and eat the whole thing. However, it's typically better just to have your co-tank taunt um, so they can actually just mitigate the damage. Now, 
it's important to make sure that everyone's aware that this is a conal attack. So it'll hit everyone behind you too. So need to make sure that nobody is standing behind either tank. We usually like to have people um, have our tanks sit at 90 degree angles um, so that there's like a 270 degree arc where people can stand um, and then just a 90 degree arc where nobody except the tank stand. Allows for a lot more freedom of movement, especially when dealing with things like Amber from Keroz, um, or AIM if you still if Hissick is still up, or what have you. The second thing that you, not only you, but everyone needs to be aware of, um, not for like a survival reason, but for a DPS reason, uh, is that 50%, or when any Mantid reaches 50% while Corvin is active, he'll encase them in Amber. Um, typically in normal mode, you just DPS Corvin to 50%, he throws Amber on himself, you kill the Amber, you kill Corvin. Um, now, some guilds may choose to do the heroic strat where you have a second mantid, get to 50%, he gets the amber, and you just ignore it. Uh, totally up to you guys. Um, what everyone that I know has done is simply got Corvin to 50%, swapped to the amber, and then killed Corvin after the amber was dead. Um, for Guardians specifically, if you berserk, if you use berserk while the amber is on one of the targets you're hitting, you won't do any damage with Mangle. Now, this is a bug. Um, Blizzard has acknowledged this is a bug. They're just not going to fix it because it's really archaic to do with how the coding of Mango works. Anyway, um, so don't berserk while one of your targets is encased in Amber. Just don't. Use an incarnation there because it's a better thing to use anyway. Um, save berserk for something else. The sixth boss, you Cook the Lucid, will activate after the third Vantage is killed. He will cast Diminish on his primary target, which deals 34% of their current health and damage. Um, he just basically spams it most of the time. So he will need to be tanked or he'll probably kill a DPS really, really quickly. Um, if you are below 25% HP, it'll just kill you. But since you're a druid and you have Frenzy Regen, that is not even remotely a problem. Um, the second thing he'll do is something called Fire Lines. Well, I mean, we call it Fire Lines. It's actually called Fiery Edge or something ridiculous. Basically, he draws Fire Lines between a bunch of people. Don't sit on them. It's the entire thing. Um, if you're connected to people, try and get further away so that you reduce the damage everyone takes. The seventh boss, Zarl the Poisoned Mind, will activate after the fourth Mantid is dead. He has two tank abilities, um, which are similar to the ones Rickle had at the very, very start. The first is called Caustic Blood, um, which will be applied to you if you're not using active negation. Um, if it gets to 10 stacks, well, it, it's a debuff, it stacks. If it gets to 10 stacks, um, It'll do a whole bunch of damage to the raid, which is really, really terrible. Um, so you just make, go and make sure you have your active mitigation up um, so that it doesn't stack to 10 and go up your raid. Zarl's second ability is called Tenderizing Strengths, which causes the person tanking Zarl to take 10% more damage per stack from Killark the Wind Reaver. Unlike Rickle's ability, which, because Rickle and Skier are active at the same time, doesn't really matter that much, and plus Rickle dies almost instantly, um, this is actually does require you to have two tanks, because it's very possible for Zarl to be active for a long time before Rip, before Kilbert comes out, which would then make your tank take a whole ton of damage from Kilbert, because he's actually pretty dangerous. Um, otherwise, yeah, you don't have to worry about this, because the person tanking Zarl will not be tanking Kilbert. The eighth boss, Castic the Manipulator, will be activated after the fifth Mantid is killed. He has no specific, no tank-specific abilities or anything a tank has to worry about. Um, he'll randomly cast stuff at people. Um, you can't hold aggro on him or anything. The only thing you need to be aware of is if he or if someone gets eaten by Kunchong, which spawns a big Kunchong. You gotta pick up the big, big Kunchong because it'll just run around eating people. Um, so if a big Kunchong spawns. Get aggro on it so it doesn't kill people, otherwise you pretty much just completely ignore him. Finally, the ninth boss, Kilwork the Windweaver, will spawn after the sixth Mantid has been killed. He has two tank-specific abilities, a one which is a debuff like Zarls and Rickles and Skiers, which causes the person tanking Kilwork to take 10% more damage from Zarl. Now, it's entirely possible Zarl will be dead by this point. Um, however, it is something you need to be aware of because Kilwork will be a, will be alive for a while. Um, so you don't want to have the same person who tanks Kilwork also tanking Zarl, unless it's like a super dire emergency and the Zarl tank is already dead. As a tank, the second thing you need to worry about from Kilwork is his combination attack. He'll get first gouge you and then run behind you and stab you with both daggers or whatever claws, whatever he's using. Anyway, it's basically a rogue thing, right? Um, this will do a pretty, pretty significant amount of damage to you, um, so you want to make sure that uh, when he gouges you, 
if you're first progressing on the encounter, try and have a cooldown up, like Bark Skin, Survival Instincts or something. Um, once you have been killing it for a while, it's nothing to write home about. You just kind of sit there and ignore it. But when you're first progressing on the counter, it can do a serious amount of damage, so you just want to make sure you're aware of that. For tanking items, depending on how much gear you have, whether this is farm or progression fight for you, you may actually want to use the tanking cloak, especially because Kilrook and Corvin can hit really hard if you are like forced to sit in the shield bash or you're tanking Kilrook for a really long time. Um, it's possible that they will start hurting really, really bad. So you want to make sure um, that you're giving yourself every possible chance to survive. So if it's a progression fight for you, you might want to consider using the tanking cloak. Obviously use the tanking meta because there's no reason not to. Um, but if this is like farm and you're just kind of brothel stomping your way through it, you can go ahead and use the DPS cloak, obviously. For talents, uh, tier 1 you can go with Wild Charge or Feline Swiftness. Well, the only reason to take Wild Charge is for immobilizing Skier Slimes. Um, otherwise, Feline Swiftness is just as good for getting out of Amber and any other movement you have to do. For Tier 2, you can take Ysera's Gift or Scenarian Ward. There's a lot of predictable damage in this fight on not only you, but other raid members. So Scenarian Ward can be good to use. Uh, tier 3, take Typhoon, Stasso Tanglement, and Fila, uh, Fairy Swarm are both pretty useless. Um, tier 4, Soul of the Forest or Incarnation, take your pick, doesn't matter. Uh, I like Incarnation specifically for extra DPS on uh, the Amber from Corbin, but that's personal choice, it really doesn't matter, and just extra DPS throughout the fight. Uh, when you're doing progression on it initially, it can take a little bit to get through. Um, tier 5, Bash, Vortex is worthless, uh, Roar is worthless, just stun your slime uh, if you need to. Tier 6, Nature's Vigil or Dream Scenarius, there are basically zero instances where you'll be able to use Heart of the Wild effectively, um, which means either or of those is going to give you more benefit. As for Guardian-specific things to be aware of, other than the Berserk bug, which I mentioned earlier when discussing Corvin, um, there really isn't much that you can really do, like cool stuff or things you need to watch out for or whatever. Um, other than that, being able to use Bark Skin during Shield Bash is pretty useful if you have to soak it. Um, otherwise, you'll have to pre-time uh, Survival Instincts or Might Over Sock, which can be a bit of a pain, but um, yeah, that's pretty much it. All in all, I know this is a very long video, um, due to the sheer number of things to talk about when, when it comes to Paragons. However, uh, I hope you found it useful, and good luck to you in the Siege of Ogrimmar.